Hi friends, hope you are doing well. Today I am going to discuss the concept of the research gap and this concept is very important whether you are a PhD student who is thinking about writing a PhD proposal or you may be somebody who is an established researcher and is thinking of writing a research proposal either to get grants or for a postdoctoral application or for a sabbatical. So let's discuss this topic in depth. Now let's define research gap and this is essentially a topic which has not been sufficiently explored in the current research literature and by currently research literature we mean journal papers, conference papers, thesis, books which are available in the public domain. So in the years gone by we used to go to the library and try to do the literature search but today you have access to a lot of searchable databases. You have Google Scholar, you have Web of Science and you have Scopus. So you can go to any of these databases and search for particular topics to find the research gap in the literature. Now if you are somebody who doesn't have access to Web of Science and Scopus from your university, you can always go to Google Scholar because this is essentially free. So let's look at five steps about the research gap process. The fifth step is a bonus step for people who are specially doing a PhD. Now number one is that you have to do a literature review and before you even begin a literature review you have to find a research problem and this is a broad research problem this is not yet your localized problem which you are going to do in your PhD or postdoc or proposal. So this kind of broad research problem can come to you from a supervisor if you are a PhD student maybe your supervisor is going to give you a ready-made problem in that case you are quite lucky. But in many cases what happens is that the supervisor may actually tell you go and find your own research problem. So in this case you will actually have to figure out the research problem in the broad domain. So let's assume two particular situation one coming from mechanics and one coming from bio. So in a mechanics type of situation let's look at fluid mechanics you may have a problem in fluid mechanics. Now fluid mechanics is too broad a domain to actually do a research gap finding in. So what you do is you narrow it down, maybe you are somebody who is interested in micro air vehicles and so you look at transition in low Reynold number fluid flow. This could be a problem in which you try to delve deeper. So you need to substantially go deep within a particular field to find a good problem because nowadays it's very hard to cover a literature survey on a big field for example in fluid mechanics. Now if you are in the bio domain maybe you are somebody working in virology that is the study of viruses and so it's not a good idea to try to do a literature search on viruses themselves. You have to zoom down you may pick up coronaviruses in bats and then you can do a search in this area as to what are the coronaviruses which have been discovered in bats and what is the research published in this area. So you need to go through all the papers published in this area which are there in Google Scholar and also some thesis and books and so on because do remember that not all the research gets published in research papers and there are some research especially in some countries such as in Europe and other countries where the research may actually exist only in the thesis but these also count as research which has been done because if people put this thesis in the public domain that means you can browse the internet and get it then essentially they are part of the research literature. Now one of the best ways about doing a literature survey is to try to find a review paper in that field and if somebody has written a review paper for example on coronaviruses or on low Reynold number fluid flow transition then this is going to be a very good point to begin because essentially this person has done a lot of work for you and so one of the things people like to do is they try to find hold of a review paper. Now sometimes if you are not able to get hold of a review paper you can also get hold of a recent PhD thesis in this area because very often the PhD thesis will also give a literature review in the introduction chapter and this is one of the greatest advantages of having various PhD thesis online. So you will find that nowadays most universities put up the thesis of PhD students on some form of web page and you can very easily access this. So if you know somebody whose papers you have seen you can go and try to find if they have a thesis in which some of this information is there. So the thesis is going to have a much more detailed literature survey than you are going to find in any of their papers. So this is certainly something which is going to help you. 
Now, once you have done this literature review, you have collected a lot of literature, you have read these research paper and so on. What you have to do is a critical analysis of the literature. So now you have to take each paper and you have to go through it very thoroughly. So you have to read the introduction, you have to read the method section, you have to read the results and discussion, look at the numerical results and then look at the conclusion. So essentially at the end of reading all these papers, what you should do is that you should be able to find the limitations, mistakes, gaps which have been made in all these papers. So essentially whenever somebody does a research study, they make a lot of assumptions which simplify their problem and they also make a lot of approximations which are essentially limiting their work but very often they do not state it in their paper because they want to put their best foot forward. So what you need to do is to actually critically look at the paper and see what are the limitations in their study which have come out from the approximations which they have made. Now one good way is to tabulate all this information in an excel spreadsheet. So essentially you can take a spreadsheet and you can put all this information in different cells. Now one thing certainly which is going to help you is to figure out what are the limitations in the work. So I'll give you some examples here. For example, a person may have made an approximation that the system is a linear system and this he may have done to simplify his study. This is very often done in engineering fields and you may be somebody who thinks that this is actually not a linear system and so you could extend this work to non-linear systems. Sometimes you find results where there are a lot of differences between experimental predictions and theoretical or computational predictions. So here also there could be some lacuna, something missing in the physics of the problem which could be something you could identify as a possible research field which can be tackled. So again, this is very often the case in many engineering problem that the computer simulations are not matching with the experimental results and this could mean that some physics is not yet known. Now, there are certain situations where it may not be just the physics of the problem. So the lack of correlation could be because of the mathematical modeling. It also could be because of uncertainty factors which are there. So there may be many factors in uncertainty which may even impact the experimental data. So all these things can come to mind. So whenever you are trying to read a paper critically, you have to try to figure out what are the limitations, what are the mistakes, what are the approximations, what are the gaps and this is going to certainly help you write your own literature review which is essentially the first chapter of your introduction in a PhD thesis. So now once you have done this critical analysis of the literature, the step three is to define the research gap. And now you have to sit down with all this literature. Hopefully you have summarized it and put it in a Excel spreadsheet. And then you need to meditate for some time about what is the possible research gap. And here you need to find certain problems where the existing literature is not sufficiently focused on. So there are always these kind of problems out there. There are questions which have not been answered. There are problems which have not been tackled and so on. For example, you may find in your study that there is an enormous amount of research on bad coronaviruses, but not on coronaviruses found in pangolins, for example, or feral cats or some different species and this could be a gap which you want to fill. Maybe you are living in a geographical area where certain creatures or animals are there and these could be subject of investigation for any kind of viruses and so on. Or maybe you are somebody who is very well versed in probability and stochastic processes and you feel that the discrepancy between the numerical simulations and the experimental results are not only coming from physics modeling, but they could be coming from uncertainty itself. There could be stochastic variations taking place in the parameters of the model. So that again, something which you can look at. So essentially, once you start defining the research gap, you know the questions which have not been tackled in the literature, then you are quite ready for step number four, which is to find the research objectives. And the research objectives essentially take this analysis which you have done before and they put it in a format which you can handle in your own thesis or in your own research work or in your own proposal. So something known as the SMART research objectives is there where SMART is simply an acronym which stands for specific, measurable, achievable, relevant and time based. For example, if you are going to do a problem where you want to include certain non-linear effects in a model, then you need to clearly define how you are going to include these 
results, how you are going to do this modeling and how much time it is going to take to do this model because that's something very important whenever you are writing a PhD proposal or a research proposal you need to have an estimate of time in terms of any modeling effort you are going to do, any experiment you are going to do and so on. So sometime it may be that your research objective is simply to do an experiment. You have found that there is a plethora of literature out there on computational problems, but nobody has actually done an experiment and you may become a strong leader in the field by doing the first experiment in the area and then letting the various experimentalists figure out what they need to do or rather letting the various computational people try to compare with your experimental results. So this kind of work can often become very heavily cited also and it can get you some acclaim in the field. Now finally point number five is the bonus point and this point is very important especially for PhD students and this is to make sure that your research gap is not too big because if you find a research gap which is too big then it's going to take a lot of time to fill it and it may not be something which a PhD student can really do. So when you are a PhD student you need to find a research gap which can be filled in three to five years and very often if you have a PhD supervisor who is quite mature who has been in the business for a decade or more he or she can actually help you find such a field but if you are somebody who is working with a new PhD supervisor this person may be very motivated very ambitious but do keep in mind that your research gap should not be too large because then what will happen is that you will not be able to close the research gap in a small amount of time and you will get increasingly stressed out. So one of the factors in doing any problem in life is to find a problem which is actually doable because when you are doing a PhD or a postdoc you may be just one person with very little help. So your research gap should be very narrowly focused. Now that is the trick here if you want to get a PhD in a reasonable amount of time. Do not find a research gap which is too big unless you are already an established professor running a research center then you can tackle some very big problems in the field for example why does transition take place in fluid mechanics between laminar flow and turbulent flow that is for maybe full professors and chairmen to take on but when you are a PhD student try to focus on very narrow aspects of this particular problem. So that was my video for today I hope you benefit from this video and I will see you in a video sometime soon see you then